apologies for that. We're almost there. But, uh, but you just what one point that we just make now from a technical standpoint before we get started on the session is that um, is that we won't be using the chat. So we'll rather be using the Q and A. Um, so if, say for everyone that wants to put their questions uh, as the panel's going along, then please do put them in the Q and A. And uh, and say with that last comment, so I'm happy to uh, hand over to Emma. Thanks, Emma. Thank you, Samantha. So for everyone who just um, witnessed the last 15 minutes, you'll see how lucky we are in the CIPR International Committee. We have uh, public relations practitioners from all corners of the world and all bringing their input in. One very common thing that we've all experienced in the last couple of years is the increase in things like fake news, disinformation. We all experienced um, a unique moment, uh, not quite unique, historically not so, but with the pandemic, which was actually incredibly unifying. However, um, I would argue that within that more than one moment, far too long period, that actually the disruption in trust in where we're going to get our sources of information, in our belief systems, in the leadership that we've experienced, was disrupted even further than it was before. I am very lucky to be joined by an incredible panel here today um, who are going to, we're going to have a conversation about PR and the state of truth. And we're going to ask questions such as what is our role in, in PR in, in trying to deal with this situation? We'll, we'll get to grips with some of the, some of those institutions that have really um, been impacted by that damage and trust and actually what that means for us and for the people who, who are actually, who we, the consumers and the, and the context that we're talking to. So I'm going to introduce myself. I should have done that first. My name is Emma Duke. Um, I run my own consultancy, Emma Duke PR, surprisingly enough. And um, I'm a committee member with the CIPR um, International Committee. Um, I'm joined by Christine Richardson, who is Group Communications Director of Oxford University Press. Previously, um, she worked at City and Guilds. Christine is also chair of the Education and Skills CIPR Committee. Eduardo Suarez, who is editor, head of editorial uh, for the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. And for those who don't know about the Reuters Institute, I would heavily suggest that you go and have a look. It's an international organization bringing journalists together from all over the world to conduct research into what's going on within journalism and the future of it. Previously, Eduardo was a journalist himself and has worked at numerous um, kind of news startups and um, so has lots to say about the innovation and evolution of the news industry. And then um, Jerry Sullivan, who is chair of the International Public Affairs um, part of Edelman Global, Global Advisory. Jerry has a fascinating past, as I just found out, including probation and parole officer at one point. So we'll come on to that one, Jerry, later. <laughs> um, I'm going to start the conversation off by um, asking each of our panelists a bit about the recent research that they've all been conducting in this area. You'll be glad to know that actually all of their expertise is backed up with figures and statistics that is entirely <laughs> trustworthy. Um, so I feel like that's a good place to start in this discussion. So Christine, Oxford University Press uh, recently launched a research report on fact-finding in today's world. How people are validating their sources for information around the world. And it produced some really interesting insights. Could you give us an overview of some of that, some of those research findings? Thanks, Emma. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, so the um, the report we put together is called the Matter of Fact. Um, and as a publisher, we often talk about what our role is in wider society, and we very much see ourselves as being able to create resources that help people make sense of the world around them. Um, and helping people to explore different topics and themes. So rather than saying this is the truth, we help people in pursuit of truth, if you will. Um, and, and we felt there was, um, we kind of seen what's been going on around the world, this idea of the infodemic that we've heard so much about during the pandemic, um, and, and thought there was an opportunity to try and understand where people are going with information, how they try to validate facts. So we surveyed around 5,000 people in the UK, US, South Africa, India, and Mexico. And I think it, 
probably the, the main picture that we took from it was a, was a picture of confusion. Um, I think there was a strong understanding that people knew there were so many ways to access information, so many means at our disposal to, um, to find out new facts. But then there was this real concern around confidence quality of the information people are accessing, um, whether platforms could be trusted, whether we can be confident in the information that we're sharing. Um, so I think one of the most stark findings that we found for example is that 40, just under 40% said they didn't know how to tell, tell what information was true. Um, and about three quarters said the pandemic made them even more cautious about the accuracy of the information they encounter. So quite stark findings around the concern people are feeling when, when accessing information. But on the flip side, three quarters of confident that the information they shared on social media was true. Um, and 80% and of they were actually checking the facts that they, they were reading. How truthful that is, I, 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 I think, is, a, is up for debate. Um, and and it, again, we then saw some really interesting international comparisons. So Brits tended to be much more skeptical of social media, probably not a huge surprise, with 16% of us citing it as a preferred source. Whereas in 54% uh, of um, those that we surveyed in India um, choose to uh, turn to it to find facts. Um, equally, Brits weren't as a, uh, well, it's often thought that the um, social media was a good way of helping to separate facts from fiction. Um, only, only about a quarter of us, of us in Britain thought that compared to say 80% in India. So some really interesting global disparities as well. And I think ultimately, people are saying they're looking at multiple sources. Um, we saw increase in trust in experts, increase in um, trust in among academics, for example. But you know, when we've only just scratched the surface of what is a huge, huge topic, and that we know that there are so many sources people can turn to, and when there are millions of answers that people can give, I think that's all feeding into this kind of global picture of confusion. Brilliant. Thank you, Christine. Like you say, there are so many sources of information that people access. And I'm going to turn to Eduardo now because news media is importantly one of those sources. Now the Reuters Institute conducts a piece of research once, once a year I believe called the Digital News Report um, and I wondered Eduardo if you could talk to us a bit about the um, one of the one of the things that really came up this year well it's, it's been for a couple of years since the pandemic is um, news avoidance and um, so but first of all kind of how that's how that's playing out and then also what impact that might have. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, um, Emma. Um, yeah, as you said, I mean, at the Reuters Institute, we publish uh, every year um, this uh, report, our signature report, the Digital News Report, and it covers 46 countries, um, um, covering, uh, you know, around half of the world's population. It is based on 93,000 interviews. Um, it is conducted by YouGov, and then our experts analyze the data and, you know, come up with, with the main themes. And as you said, I mean, this year particularly, um, we were really, really um, surprised, you know, by the degree in which uh, news avoidance uh, uh, have increased in the uh, has increased in the last uh, in the last uh, few months. I think it's, it is um, around forty six percent in the UK who tells us uh, that they avoid the news, um, um, you know, in some way, uh, at least some part of the news or some particular uh, news. Um, and that's and that's really a lot. Uh, and it is a percentage that has grown in many of the countries that we cover in the report. And, and as you said, it has to do with the pandemic, obviously, and with, uh, you know, the news fatigue, uh, you know, uh, after so, so many, so many things that are, you know, kind of depressing, like the pandemic, but also the war in Ukraine, the of living crisis. Um, this is something that we see um, around a lot. Um, the other thing that we saw this year that was uh, also very interesting was that um, uh, interest in news, uh, and especially in political news, has gone down in many countries, including the UK, including Spain, including the US. And we think it's something to do also with polarization. Um, it, is, it is something to do also with uh, the kind of um, the, the kind of uh, very very shouting uh, you know tone of, of, of the news coverage uh, uh, very often uh, 
uh, we just seen this in the UK recently uh, with the events unfolding this week, but we see that in other countries. And I think the main challenge for the news media uh, and also for peer uh, professionals is how to cut through that noise and how to actually, um, you know, get people interested. Uh, most of the people uh, don't look like us. Most of the people uh, of most of the audience are mostly indifferent, uh, indifferent towards news and they are not so much um, interested in, in in the in the twists and turns uh, of the of the political crisis, and I think that's um, that's something that we see time and again with when we do research. I mean, most of the population are just indifferent to news. It's just it's not just that they are distrusting or they're just indifferent. Indifferent, and I think that's that's a really a really big challenge um, for journalists and for politicians too. Um, that people should care about public affairs, and it's difficult to get them into because of all the noise that we see around. It's a really interesting point, Eduardo. I um, know that times like today, when the UK Prime Minister just resigned, I immediately <laughs> leaped to my laptop, my phone, my, my radio and my ear, and I've got it all on watching what's happening on Twitter, everything the whole time. But then on Friday, for example, and again, very UK focused, but the... Um, chancellor in the UK was fired effectively and I was at an event with teachers and I was saying oh oh we've got a new chancellor and they were like what what <laughs> so I think it's a really interesting point particularly when either as an organization or as, or as a government you're trying to capture people's information you're trying to actually persuade people to do something just kept capturing their their attention is quite hard yeah, exactly. And and I think, you know, what you describe about the, the teachers, uh, the conference or whatever, I, I think that's something that we, we all have experienced. I mean, most of the people we deal with uh, in our lives, my sister, you know, my friends who are not journalists, um, you know, perceive the news like a sideshow. It's something that they, that there's, it's in their lives. Sometimes they pay attention, they think it's worth it. Um, but many people have this attitude that you know they they feel that news will find them uh, if it's really worth it and and it's kind of rational in a way i mean and when there is something new something really big and, and something new people find out um but i think for that reason i think we should at least as journalists i mean we should think about um how to engage um that particular segment of the population which is the majority of the population i mean most people are not news junkies uh, as much as we are news junkies um you know probably all of all of all of us in this call um and i think that's that's a challenge and that's something that um, some news organizations are um trying uh, and trying to, to 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 achieve um and we can we can talk a, a bit about possible solutions later on too thanks eduardo now when we're talking about trust and we're talking about pr it's impossible. I tell, I guarantee you, if you go to any conference, wherever you are in the world, someone will mention the Edelman Trust Barometer. And um, so we're very lucky to have Jerry here um, to join this conversation. It, I mean, like I say, the, the Trust Barometer is one of the biggest tools in, in our kind of toolkit in PR. And it helps us get a better understanding of where people put their trust or what informs it. And I wondered, Jerry, could you start by talking about some of the kind of core themes in the 2022 report? Obviously, any sneak peeks since then, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, over to you. Yeah, thanks, um, uh, Emma. Yeah, the, we've been at this 23 years this year. Um, I haven't seen the data for this year, which will come out at Davos uh, in January. But, um, but it is kind of interesting and in listening to Christine and Eduardo the, um, I think there's some similarities. In general, uh, media is in a free fall. Uh, the, as you look at the numbers last year, trusted media declined in 15 of the 27 countries that we went out to. Uh, interestingly though, when you look at the breakout, it's actually quite high in some of the governments or countries where we would think maybe freedom of speech is not uh, you know, as prevalent. Uh, the number one, 80% trust uh, in the media in China. Um, 64% in Saudi, 64% in the UAE compared to just 39% in the US and, and around the same in the UK. So, um, so there's, um, 
you know, it's headed in the wrong way. When you look at the four institutions, the, the uh, business, media, government, NGOs, uh, business and NGOs are at the top. Government, not surprisingly, based on what happened today and what we've gone through here in the States, uh, is on the decline. And media, you know, which just looking back just to 2020, media has had about a 20% drop. So there's something afoot there. I don't know exactly what it is. But I, uh, I think it's kind of interesting what Eduardo was talking about. Uh, the phrase I think he used was, you know, most people think, you know, the news will find them. And I think it does. And this is something we talked a little bit about, uh, Emma, earlier this week, in that the way that we all get our news now is we, we're sort of our own little news networks. We aggregate what we're going to get, whether it's on sports or politics or whatever. You know, you have your own news feeds, and that's where you get your information. So, um, so when something... Today's a perfect example, trust uh, stepping down. It depends which publications or websites you go to, you're gonna get a completely different um, spin on it. So um, it's just, uh, yeah, it's challenging. And we're just seeing this weird kind of morphing of media in general where, you know, anybody with a camera or an iPhone right now is a journalist. So uh, things are, are definitely changing. And I'm not sure if it's for the better. It's a really interesting point you make about the, um difference in how people feel and their levels of trust of media depending on kind of the role of government. I worked with a colleague on this call, Saad, um, earlier this year on some work in uh, the UAE and the Gulf region. And I was meant to be giving some training on crisis management. And one of the pieces of advice he gave me and also the agency I was working with is that crisis management is just not a thing in some countries within the UAE in that region because of how controlled the media is. Um, so it was fascinating. Whereas in countries like the UK and in the US and West, a lot of Western economies where there is more freedom of speech, you can always see that distrust is even greater because we're questioning every single thing. And, and that feeds into the kind of public perception. Funnily enough, for once, the UK media were all in one place this morning. <laughs> unfortunately for this trust um so i'm gonna ask a bit about dig a bit deeper on this distrust thing because we know that there are we've talked initially about some of the reasons why that distrust is there and jerry your point about those four institutions is really key but actually then that leads us to well who do we trust so you know we've got media and government really low in trust levels according to the barometer um uh, business and NGOs really high um, and I mean where where do where would any of you I'm going to ask you each to kind of pitch in on this where would you say actually there there is fault there is accountability for um, or even when you could pick a time in fact for, for where that distrust in the information that most the average person gets about their life how they fit into the world what to do next um where where was that where's that damage come from that's a massive question apologies i'm going to start with you christine thanks where to start um <laughs> i mean thinking about where where that distrust comes from it's a, a it feels like a bit of a, a fed's answer but i don't think you can really just blame one group i mean i think um Edelman in the report, sorry, Jerry, I'm probably stealing some of your points here, um, but thus, um, this year identified that idea of the cycle of distrust. You know, on the one hand, you've got government media feeding into this cycle of division that we're seeing play out in so many different ways across society. I think we're probably more divided than we've ever been um, at the moment, and that's in things like social media are bringing that to the fore so much, much more than ever before. And on the other side, you've got NGOs and businesses who are often trying to tackle societal issues or get involved in these debates can't always deliver or they find themselves on the wrong side of the debate and it escalates and it just feels like a bit of a vicious cycle um, and then I think equally if you're looking at the journalists there is that idea of they, hold, they can hold visitors to account they're there to, to highlight issues they're there to be you know to represent the views of the public and surface issues spark conversation but at the same time the role of the journalists has changed as well and you know they're they're being measured on click rates and advertising spend in a way that, that never happened previously in the same way. 
Um, and so we're often seeing things like news stories having real clickbaity headlines. And we've got examples of things like this at NUP where we've put out positive stories. And actually the article itself will be really balanced and really well written, but the headline is purely driven, it's purely, purely written, sorry, to drive debate and to, to get people to have a moan about something that isn't reflective of the story. So I, I don't think that you can say there's one single point. I think you've got a, a series of different areas that are all feeding into to one mass cycle of discourse, really. Actually, that's a really good point. Eduardo brought up the point about polarisation earlier. And I wonder if we could drill down into that slightly. Jerry, would you um, mind kind of pitching in on this? What impact would you say, again, we talked about this recently, the, the polarisation of um, opinion is having on trust? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I think if we just look, I've been doing this a long time for Edelman. Um, and, uh, you know, in the early days, it was so much easier in some ways because we had you know, we had the three networks and probably five newspapers that really were driving the conversation, but that's all changed now because of the landscape. And then I think the other thing in most recent times that uh, just rewritten all the rules is Trump. Um, and I'm not here to, you know, uh, support or pick on him, but if you look at the data that we, uh, that we have, uh, we do a subset of how it breaks down in the U.S. based on Republican and Democratic, you know, persuasion. And it's like night and day. Um, you know, 70% of Republicans polled last year think that Trump won the election. So it's just, you know, this, this whole, there's this new approach to, um, to the media, and I'm not saying mainstream media, uh, like, you know, Reuters and other respected publications, but this, these new forms of media, podcasts, and they have huge followings, um, you know, look at uh, Breitbart, you, uh, you know, so you just lean, the new, the new approach, and you saw a little bit of this even in the UK with Boris, where um, you just lean in on the negatives and it's like you deny it and say that's just not true and the mainstream media will say well of course it's true because here are the facts and it's like no I that that never happened and mm -hmm. the here in the states um, it's it's really bad to be honest with you I mean on political issues on issues like climate you know uh, on social issues um, you know reform it's so uh, we're just so um, divided uh, and it falls along media lines as well. So, uh, you know, I don't want to be a, you know, a doomsday prophet, but it really is, we haven't, you know, uh, from a political standpoint, uh, we haven't really figured that out. You sort of go to the people um, that are going to support your position. But I think the battle right now, whether it's on politics or news or issues, is on the swing voter. Because, you know, it sort of falls into two camps. I'm either on this side of the debate or that side. But there is sort of this you know, decent sized middle that, you know, you can hopefully persuade uh, to your cause. And that could be on everything from what type of dish detergent they're going to buy to what candidate they're going to vote for. So, yeah. um, you know, I don't, I don't think I have the answer. Eduardo might have an interesting perspective coming from sort of the media side, particularly with, you know, uh, an organization I have a tremendous amount of respect for, um, because I think the rules have been changed. It's just, uh, it's a different ballgame. Actually, I'm going to um, ask Eduardo to follow up, but I'm going to add an element to this for you, Eduardo, and what role you think social media has had. First of all, on trust, and um, to Jerry's point about kind of that polarisation, but then also the news industry and the credibility within the news, the news industry versus social media. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, um, Emma. I mean, Something that we know for sure about uh, social media is that people trust news on social media much less than they trust news in general. Um, uh, and this might be good news, actually. I mean, people are actually skeptic uh, about the things that they see on social media. They know that they are in an environment where you can find you know, trustworthy news, but also all kinds of propaganda, partisan you know, opinions. Um, um, so that's that's something that I think is good is uh, the other thing I would say is that um, it's usually older uh, audiences um, who are 
uh, probably a bit less skeptical about what they see on social media. And they, this might be something to do with the fact that they uh, grew up in, an, in a news environment that was very different uh, and that was, you know, made of the networks, as Jerry said before, and, and, uh, and of different kind of news organizations than the one that the ones you, we, we see today. Um, on this trust uh, and the U.S., I think we should uh, stress um, that the U.S. is 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 such a is such a special case. I mean, in our global sample, we cover forty six countries. Um, we don't see the the kind of super polarized situation that we see in the U.S. Um, almost in, in 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 no other country. Um, and and the and the reason for that, and Jerry pointed that out, is is the Republican Party and Republican audiences. I mean. Uh, Republican audiences, I think it's 10% of them uh, who actually say uh, the trust the news, 10%, uh, around 10%. And it's been like that for a few years. Obviously, it has to do with Trump, but but also with the anti-media tendencies of the of the Republican Party um, that have been there for maybe 20, 30 years now. Um, so that that's a very particular situation. And in, in most of the countries that we cover in the report, uh, things are not so polarized as, as they are in the US. Uh, things are very different in Germany or in Spain or even in Italy. And that's something that we should take into account in the analysis. I mean, it's not that the internet has kind of destroyed, uh, you know, trust uh, in news everywhere. It, there are some particular news environments and the case of the US is very interesting because it has to do with social media, but it, it was there much, much before social media. It has to do with the rise of Fox News. It has to do with the end of the uh, fairness doctrine in, in TV, uh, in TV broadcasting, and the decline of the networks, as as Terry discussed before. So, it's, it's not like you know, like the internet is is some kind of curse, uh, universal curse. Uh, it is playing out differently in different countries. And finally, about this trust, is 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 good to recognize that when people. Um, um, when we ask people about misinformation, and this is a word that we use all time and again, you know, sometimes we think that people think about, you know, Russian bots or this kind of uh, foreign political interference, which is important to take into account, of course. Uh, but most of the people, when they hear about misinformation or fake news or, or these kind of words, um, they are thinking either uh, about um, bad journalism, like partisan journalism or clickbait or, or things that are not really fact-checked and that they see um, because they know the field and they know they are wrong or, or slightly wrong. Um, and the other thing is propaganda, political propaganda. They, they, they blame uh, domestic politicians um, for things that they are not true, that they are saying all the time. And sometimes it's, you know, part of political campaigning, but sometimes it's, it's something a bit, uh, a bit more important as, as it is happening in the US now or in Brazil with, with questioning elections and questioning election results, which is something that, uh, well, thankfully uh, in Europe, we are not seeing uh, um, so far. But I think those things are really important to take into account because sometimes um, the debates about misinformation, uh, misinformation are focused more on bots or social media or political indifference from, from other countries. And most of the issues have to do with either politicians or journalists in, in, in each country. It's interesting how reflective that is of the trust barometer as well, though, with the kind of lack of trust in media and government again. Um, and yeah, I know. I mean, recent elections in Kenya also that kind of lots of kind of um, debate on that one. Um, so I'm going to ask um, some more positive questions in a minute, and we're going to move things into a better place because we can help the situation. Um, but while I, while we carry on talking, I'm going to encourage anyone um, attending to first of all give us your views on this. It will be really interesting to hear kind of how this is impacting in different parts of the world. Um, I joined a global alliance call a couple of months ago, and it was really interesting how prevalent the kind of concern about fake news was in certain parts of the world. So first of all, your input in the Q&A section, and then also your questions for our panel. Because as insightful as my questions are, I feel like actually, um, and we're going to get an awful lot of better questions from you guys too so um feel free to send those in and then i will feed them into our conversation so um i'm going to carry on talking for now so we don't have to sit here in a, uh, an awkward silence um 
Jerry, what kind of advice would you give to fellow communicators when your audiences are increasingly skeptical of the media? How do we reach our stakeholders, our audiences now? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a good question and uh, not always an easy answer, but I, I do think that um, what we're trying to do more and more of is uh, diversification of our, you know, uh, of our public relations. It used to be, and there's still a bit of this, you know, we would get calls from clients or perspectives and uh, it was like to help them get in or out of the newspaper. Well, that's all changed as we've just been talking about. So it's kind of interesting because it's just, um, we're talking about this distrust in social media, which Eduardo brought up, which I agree with And looking at our data. When we ask people to sort of rate their level of trust in various um, channels, uh, social media only had 37% uh, trust. Uh, and it was down 8% year on year. Owned media, traditional media was at 43%, or I'm sorry, 57%. Owned media, which is websites and whatnot, 43. But the number one was search engines. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. And we, you know, of course we're using a lot of, um, you know, uh, digital and everything we do now. But I think it's trying to find a unified approach that's using all the channels available. Um, and whether it's using, you know, uh, you know, uh, paid media, uh, as, as we're seeing, it's all morphing so much. It's hard to, if you look at COP27, which is coming up, um, there, you have the actual program where all of the, you know, the uh, people, the, the decision makers will be together debating climate. But then you have this entire media zone where you have New York Times, Financial Times, running these huge events on the side, kind of doing what we used to, well, we still do, but kind of doing what we do. So uh, it's uh, it's kind of interesting how we're seeing this, you know, sort of cross pollinization. So I guess my big going back to your question, it would be just I think you have to use multiple channels um, because if I only hear it in the news, if I hear it once in the news, I'm not going to believe it. We know from trust, it's like three to you have to hear it three to five times, you know, for it to sort of break through and to be trustworthy. Um, and it's got to be from different sources. So if you're a New York Times reader and there's five articles about an issue, that's not going to do it alone. You know, you got to be, you got to see it in the New York Times. You got to see it on BBC. You know, you got to hear it on the radio. Uh, when you're, you know, uh, when you're, you know, clicking through your social media, you got to be hit with it. So it's really trying to figure out how's that, how to amplify through this sort of surround sound mechanism. Uh, and that's what we're doing more and more of. And you know, by adding different capabilities, you know. Digital is like huge for us now. It is for every one of the major uh, PR firms. It's such a big part. And um, and just one last point: if you look at politics, um, and we're in the middle of you know midterm elections here in Washington, so I mean the ads are just incredible. Um, but you're getting bombarded with them on during prime time or around sporting events when people are watching, but also in your social media, um, because you know algorithms follow us wherever we go. So. Um, so yeah, you have to put those tools to uh, to work for you. That's what we're doing anyway. Thanks, Jerry. Um, now I'm going to flip this question slightly um, and move to Christine. Um, Mabel has very helpfully asked a well-timed question because there is an important. Uh, I see. Feel like it's important to acknowledge the role of PR in distrust as well. Like if we think about the fact that we're always biased to an extent in the interest of our clients or our companies that we work for um, and well as the Trust institute of public relations we are all signed up to our code of conduct and we are all working ethically there's a really important acknowledgement if we are trying to build trust in society of of actually where our interests lie mabel's really added to this about how do you uh, maintain those standards um, if you're, for example, a PR agency or a PR running a political campaign, how how do we restore trust as PR or PR people in in this world where actually we're we're automatically biased? I think it's such an interesting question, and it's not helpful because PR itself, as an industry, doesn't have the best of reputation. Um, traditionally, has often been associated with in the truth or trying to put a positive shine on bad news um, or, or was towing a very much a kind of company corporate line um, and that is something we're going to have battle against um, ultimately we 
we are a little bit of access to societal mistrust because often we are being encouraged to push messages um, that push stories that may to make them seem better than they might be. Um, and we've all seen examples in the media companies being called out for greenwashing, for example. Um, and equally, we're also there to help protect companies when things go wrong and help protect the reputation and minimise the risk. So we are a difficult place um, because ultimately we do have to represent our organisations. So I think that's that's where actually PR has a really valuable role to play in making sure it's seen as a true strategic partner, um, one that is working with really the to understand our audiences understand what they are looking for, what they respect and what they value in an organisation. Um, understanding where, where we can add value to those audiences and where we, what, how, how we are helping to address their concerns, their needs, um, and be able to influence our leaders in that regard, to be able to advise them properly, then, not pushing stories when it's not needed or um, making sure that we're coming up, um, organisations come across as authentic and I think authenticity is something that's becoming an even bigger trend. And we see that time and time again, the leaders who, who stand up and who stand out and people who are seen as authentic, who aren't seen to be um, having a separate agenda or, or, um, or spinning the truth. And that can be quite challenging for some of our leaders. Um, and, and it can take a bit of work, but being authentic, being authentic for what your organisation stands for as well, not trying to be something you're not, I think it's be really really important and how that plays out in the different channels as well as that is very very important. I think we all know how it feels to be that PR standing opposite a leader asking whether something really is <laughs> true um, <laughs> or actually um, legitimate in order to to say um, but I think your point about kind of speaking truth to power is really important here. And, and actually, just on that theme of um, how do we, as professionals in whatever industry we're in, um, kind of maintain or start rebuilding that trust? I'm going to move back to Eduardo just on the point about news media, because in my mind, actually, historically, news media is the way in which leaders are held to, a, to account. Um, but we need a healthy um, news industry in different in every country in order to be able to do that and how do you feel Eduardo on the kind of in terms of how like, do you feel hopeful about the the future of news media um, I do uh, but I agree with you that it's a challenging time um, and it's been challenging for a while and you know the problem for journalists is this intermediation, the, this phenomenon that we see everywhere where, you know, both politicians and, you know, and business uh, people can speak to their audiences or to their customers directly uh, without, you know, any, any challenge uh, from journalists, um, you know, many politicians can, you know, can uh, uh, get to power without, you know, uh, having to face any any challenging interviews, uh, we've seen that in the UK in the last uh, conservative election. But but we see that in Spain too, um, where I'm from, and where the prime minister only gives interviews to very friendly journalists. Uh, in this case, left wing journalists. So so this is something that we see across the across the world. I mean, the ability uh, of journalists to challenge uh, people in power is kind of diminishing. Um, however. Um, uh, you know, journalists still have uh, that ability um, through different tools. I mean, and we see investigations uh, in many countries, uh, you know, throwing down, you know, prime ministers or, 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 or people in government. Um, uh, it happened, for example, in Spain a few years ago when uh, we're uh, you know, a politician, a very high profile politician in the Conservative Party had faked a, a master's degree and she had to resign because of a um, journalistic investigation. And we've seen that uh, throughout the Trump years too in the US. And it's true that, you know, it didn't, he didn't bring uh, Trump down, but but at the same time, you know, marginally, it ha it might have had uh, some influence in the fact that he lost the election uh, and, and he lost uh, fair and square. So, you know, I think still um, journalists still have that kind of ability. Um, 
However, obviously, it's not just journalists, and we've seen the UK in the last few days how you know other independent institutions have a role to play in that, and we saw that with the Bank of England and with you know the uh, you know office for budget responsibility how all that played out at the same time, and also in the US where checks and balances balances are also important. So, it's, journalism is not operating in a vacuum. Obviously, you know it operates in, in as as one of the checks to political power and, and to and to company the power of, com, of big companies too uh, but there are also there are, you know actors that I think they're still working at least in some in some in some countries uh, but it definitely has made things very very difficult I mean the internet the rise of social media the fact that politicians can speak uh, directly to their voters um, that is something that had made things um, much more difficult for us of course definitely. And um, actually, it's a slightly different point here, but Samantha has asked a question about what impact um, the pandemic had on trust. And I'm going to go to Jerry for that one. That's all right. You? Well, it's kind of interesting, you know, um, in terms of the institution, you know, at any time, you know, in general, um, polling going back to <laughs> the early 1900s, if you ask people about politicians, is there the answer is throw the bums out, you know, and nobody, unless, sometimes it's, you know, it changes a little bit if it's about your politician, but in general, politicians are not trusted unless there's a crisis. And we saw this during, if we look, go back and look at the data, um, we see an incredible rise in trust around 9 11 during, during the, um, you know, the economic crisis that we had. Uh, and then again on COVID, because I think in general, it's like, you know, government is, uh, you know, it's a nuisance, it's ugly, we don't, we, nobody likes government, um, unless there's a problem. And then it's like, call government, um, you know, look at the banks. I mean, nobody loves government more than the banks. They hate to be regulated until there's a, an economic freefall and they need bailed out. So, um, but in general, that's what we saw uh, happen. The um, but then going back to a little bit what Eduardo was just talking about, uh, at least in the States, my gosh, when you talk about COVID in particular, the, the machines churning on both sides about, you know, you had, you know, the uh, CDC and, uh, you know, the health HHS coming out saying, get vaccinated, you know, this helps to, uh, uh, you know, it may not prevent it, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to definitely re reduce mortality uh, rates with all kind of data to back it up. And wear a mask, you know, things like that. There was a whole other side, half the country that was like, I mean, it was it would get violent where people were like, you know, you would be literally, um, and it's happened to me personally. You during the times when we were wearing masks, people would be like, you know, yelling at you in the supermarket, you know. Uh, and uh, so it was kind of interesting there because so much of that was driven by media and social media. You know, if you looked at the during COVID. If you looked at the reporting that was going on in mainstream media and looked at, you know, CNN, the networks, et cetera, and then looked at Fox, complete, it was night and day. It was night and day uh, in terms of, you know, there was facts over here. And some of that just goes back to leadership, you know, was that the people in government where you have the commander in chief saying, you know, this, this may not be that bad, you know, uh, don't wear a mask, you know, actually, during debates uh, or before the debates, like making fun of Biden before he, because he wore a mask. So all of these things, you know, we saw play out during the crises. Um, you know, in general, though, the because we the other thing we look at is spokespeople uh, say this point and then shut up. And over the history of trust, when you ask about who are the most trusted spokespeople, it tends to be people with more technical backgrounds, engineers, you know, uh, you know, technology experts, uh, doctors and nurses. And we saw that rise during COVID as well, you know, uh, particularly in the health community. So the people you trust, it was like, you know, but one last point, when you looked at that based on, um, you know, political breakdown, the difference between Republicans and Democrats was incredible, you know, and I'm not picking on the Republicans, so I'm an independent, but it's, it is the data. So uh, nonetheless, uh, yeah, it definitely, COVID had a, an impact and the next crisis, whatever that might be, you'll see the same thing happen. It's really interesting that point about the experts because I remember during the Brexit vote as well there was this um, narrative that was actively against the kind of 
the experts who were all saying, if you leave the EU, life will be more challenging economically. But yeah, it's 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 fascinating the way kind of that trust in experts works as long as they're saying what you want them to say. <laughs> Um, now, Andreas and uh, Mabel are asking a similar question. I'm going to try and articulate that in a, in a in a reasonable way. I'm going to come to you, Christine, on the answer to this one first, if that's all right. Um, so what do our panel think about PR's role in building narratives to support a political agenda? Huh, thinking of. Um, not simple fake news, but um, building broader narratives i.e. EU versus national interest, Russian versus Ukrainian narrative, or around climate change, where and how do we set our ethical barriers? And the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm collecting Andras and Mabel's um, questions, because Mabel makes the very fair point that actually, when you're um, an agency or consultant, the client pays the bill. So how do you manage your work, your, your professional ethics and still be able to stay in business? And for me, they're quite similar. Um, feel free to spit them out if you prefer, Christine. No, um, this is a quite tough one. <laughs> I mean, I guess I have the kind of luxury of working in house in that regard, in that we have very clear um, ethics and values, and that kind of drives everything that we do, and that will drive our agency partnerships as well. Um, so, if I think about it from the flip side, you know, we are looking, we want to work with organisations that support our values that sign up we have a code of conduct that everyone we work with has to sign up to for example um and it, i think it is a really tough balance but ultimately it's to be about reputation and reputational risks and um i mean there, there have been instances of agencies caught doing things that was not good and it has just backfired and it has closed or lose a significant amount of business as a result so i think it is weighing up that risk actually is the is the client um, is, it, is the client and therefore the patient actually worth it and what's the longer term potential implications is it something that aligns to the organizational values more than anything else and um yeah i think that's i think that's kind of where you, i would have to kind of position it and think about it what is um what is ethically right how does it align with values and and is the long-term risk worth it and who can forget the great well uh, the impact on Bell Pottinger when they went to I don't want to name names, but yeah, that's that's <laughs> oh, I'm always much. the one who's gonna say it out loud, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna move over to Jerry on this one as well, actually, because um I think that I feel like that might resonate um with you. Edelman must have to play that game to an extent, um, in various ways. Yeah, and I think I kind of go to what was Christine was saying, you know, you have to look at the end of the day what's, you know, what you think is ethically right or wrong. But it's not always, you know, it's not always black or white. You know, I had to go speak to my daughters when she was in high school. I had to go speak to her class. And before we went in, she goes, what exactly is it you do, Dad? And I said, well, it's to simplify it. It's basically people come to me for one of two reasons. Get me in the news or get me out. Um, and um, not to oversimplify, but that really is how it falls. But you know, you start to think about: um, Would you work for anybody that's doing business? If the question: Would you work for anybody that's doing business in Russia? The initial reaction is going to be absolutely not, uh, unless someone comes back and says, "Well, what is it? What if it's working with a healthcare company or an NGO that has to sort of play by the rules to take care of the, you know, the population?" The same applies to Sudan, Somalia, other hotspots, Syria. Um, so it's not to say that. Yeah, we should sign up and be a shill for Putin. No way. But um, but I do think sometimes the answers aren't always clear cut. So um, I agree with what Christine was saying, but you really need to sort of take it down a level and look at every opportunity because and and just the opposite sometimes. Sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, we're on the side of the angels. And then you do a little background research and it's like, well, you know, the guy, the you know, the the CEO of the Angel Society here um, was indicted, you know, two twice, you know, or something like that. Uh, so I think you really have to look at these. It, it's not that clear cut and it's challenging. And look, we've, we've gotten beat up on certain clients that we work with and we will continue, I'm sure. But, um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, you, Dan Edelman, who was our founder, I mean, he was, you know, he was a tough old guy, but really smart. And his whole thing was like, look, if we can take on tough assignments and get people to move toward the middle, you know, whether it's around pollution or human rights or whatever, 
then we should do that because we can actually, you know, move them to do the right thing. Now, sometimes you go into those and you're like, and they are like, absolutely. And then two months in, they're not moving anywhere. And that's when you have to, you know, we've done this, you have to cut ties. Um, so, mm. but it's, it's not easy. It's not clear cut by any stretch. Indeed. I should add actually that the CIPR does have a really useful document with, about doing some due diligence on the clients you're about to sign up with. Um, and that actually, I think, came out of the Ukrainian um, and Russian um, war. Um, I've got a question for Eduardo in the chat. Um, uh, citizen journalism is prevalent now more than ever. How do journalists ensure that their voice is the loudest in an era where anyone can break news, especially on social media? How do journalists reclaim their authority as news providers? Well, that's a million dollar question. It's not easy. Um, and, it's, um, and it's not a new question. I mean, the, you know, citizen journalists have been around for, uh, you know, a few years now. Um, obviously, we saw a, a huge um, uh, influence of user generated content and, and citizen journalists during the Arab Spring, but we also saw that in Ukraine, especially through TikTok and, and, and other new channels. Um, it's changed a bit, uh, but I, I would stress that actually journalism and traditional uh, journalistic outlets are still pretty dominant um, in terms of uh, um, shaping the public conversation. Um, uh, Television, for example, that's something that we have seen during the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, suddenly became really, really important, especially during lockdown, lockdowns when, you know, everyone basically watched the news and, and watched those speeches from prime ministers and presidents about what, what was next. Um, but obviously, it's a very different media environment. And, you know, some news organizations are um, kind of harnessing this uh, in a good way, I think, and, and kind of um, presenting themselves as basically honest brokers and, and kind of aggregating what people in the field, sometimes in Syria, sometimes in Ukraine, are, are doing. And I think that's the role that we need to play. I mean, obviously, this is a different world, and you can receive videos or see videos on social media about something uh you know uh, um, uh, putting strike on you know kramatorsk in, in 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 ukraine and suddenly you have videos from the ground that are not made by professional journalists but there is a whole field right now in newsrooms and a whole uh, whole desks um uh, whose mission is actually verify these videos and try to talk to the people who made them and pay them, obviously. And uh, so this is something that I think right now, um, uh, at least in some newsroom, uh, is working really well. Um, and it's a bit the same with, you know, other challenges that we have as journalists, like artificial intelligence, for example, or, or other, other things. Obviously, technology is, is double-edged, it's a double-edged sword, and sometimes it makes things more difficult for journalists, but at the same time, it says, uh, you know, many new tools. And if you use them uh, wisely, you can do better journalism and reach, uh, you know, a, a, a bigger audience than, than we did mm. before. Yeah, and my experience is that generally the journalists are the ones who then reshare the social media content, but that's how people access it. So yeah, there's a partnership there, I think. Um, I've got a question for Jerry from Saad, um, who is another one of our committee members. Um, how can the government, how can governments rebalance the power of media of the media landscape? And just to give a bit more context on that one, before the social media era, governments were had more control of the information flow through to through the news wires, mainstream media. Um, but what does the future look like on that one? And that's it's an interesting angle on your point about kind of where uh, media is more or less kind of controlled by governments as well. Yeah, well, it's it's an interesting point um, because um, you know the it used to be in some of the more totalitarian governments. Um, I mean, I'm older than most folks on this call, but I, I I remember the Cold War, and I remember you know, hell, Brezhnev died about five times. You know, I mean, it was like you know. Every month is like Brezhnev's dead, and then you'd see him waving to people the next day, because you know there was really no way to break through the barrier of um, you know with media uh, in those, those states like that. Um, so that's the good thing, you know. The, and the good thing is we can now break through that and um, and keep government accountable and you know spread the truth in 
certain um, certain governments that aren't uh, that are a bit more dictatorial. Um, so that's the good side. The, the challenging side is kind of what Eduardo just uh, tapped into is data, um, because we're just seeing. I just think you're going to see as we go forward, uh, the media landscape is going to be driven more and more by cognitive data, you know, analytics. Um, and that's where it does, frankly, it gets a little 1984-ish and a little scary because it's like, um, even if we have the respected news organizations, um, if you can drive data through analytics and now, I mean, think we are all, you know, we're all subject to it, whether it's, you know, we look at a pair of trainers and the next thing you know, you're getting ads popping up everywhere about the new Nikes. And it's like, how the hell did they know that, you know, on my phone? And so you start to think about how analytics are playing a role. And, um, and then who's overseeing that data? You know, this is a big, we do a lot of work in this tech space and working with, you know, future cities and cognitive cities. That's one of the first questions that we get hit with by every journalist. Who's gonna, who's gonna oversee that data and what governance rules are you going to do? Or are you going to follow to uh, to address that data? Uh, so this is government's going to play a big part going forward, and um, you know it, it's a you know it's a double edged sword because uh, if you're on the government side and you say we need to regulate more, people are going to be saying you're trying to control our free speech. At the same time, if you don't, that you know they're going to say you're you're you know kowtowing to business and they're you know they're taking advantage of this data to sell me stuff or influence me on you know really important issues so uh, i wish i had the answer uh, if i did i would be a billionaire but um man it's um it's and this is something that christine and eduardo might see in the research they've done but it's um it, in one way it, it's exciting and in another way it's frightening so uh, so I, that's not a very good answer because i don't think i have one but these guys are a lot smarter than me they may have something from their research that that supports that point. Well, I would go around the whole panel and ask your opinion. Unfortunately, we are dangerously, perilously close to the end of our time. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is to say thank you to each of you, each of the panelists, Christine, Eduardo and Jerry. Thank you to everyone who's joined today and the panel and, and all the questions you put forward. And um, then I'm going to hand over to Samantha to to kind of sign off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And thanks to all the panel. That was a fantastic discussion with plenty of food for thought. Um, I was just going to come back on a point I made earlier to do with the Ukraine webinar, uh, which we said we were sorry had to be moved because of the period of, of national mourning. Um, but I'm pleased to say that that now has been rescheduled. So it's now going to be on the 16th of November at 6 p.m. Uh, UK time. So, uh, so we're putting out the information on that on social media and in our newsletter. Uh, but I think for now, it's been a great session. Thank you so much again to everyone and uh, congratulations as well to all of our new committee. Look forward to meeting uh, everyone soon next year and, uh, and carrying on our work. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, bye. Take care, bye everyone. Bye guys, cheers. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you, bye bye.